So let's uh, turn to the book of Ephesians. <coughs> And we're going to go through uh, some of the first chapter. So Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse uh, 3 down to verse 14. We start reading at verse 1 just for the connection. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus... Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the will, purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him we obtained an inheritance, having predestined, been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise <coughs> of his glory. Have you ever been uh, chosen for a team? Uh, I don't know if you remember that far back. I remember when I was at school and we would have you know, class sports and the two best guys would be captain. And, and they would pick the teams. And I used to dread that because I always got picked last. And it was just obvious that I was the least athletic person in the class. And so the captain would say, I'd have you. And the other one would say, oh, I'd have you. And I'd be sitting there, will they get to me? Will they pick me? Pick me. And uh, finally, you'd get chosen right at the end. Not here in Ephesians, but Paul says that. Paul says, I was chosen last, like one who was born out of time. And Paul here in this passage is talking about being chosen <coughs> by God and why we're being chosen. Now, you know, this passage, we're going to look at verse 3 down to verse 14. In the original Greek, it's one sentence. It's one long sentence. And it's one of the most remarkable uh, sentences in the Bible. Usually uh, when you're writing a letter in Paul's day, you'd start off uh, you know, with uh, a greeting, as he's done. We read the greeting from 1 to 3. And then there would be uh, a, either a, a doxology, a word of praise, or, or a prayer. And Paul has this one-sentence doxology, praise to God, which is uh, from verse 3 down to verse 14. And then he has a prayer. And it's the longest, most elaborate uh, outline of praise to God almost in the New Testament. And it's, it's as if Paul is opening up his own heart of worship and praise. And, and he shows us how to worship God and how we should be worshiping God. And so we're going to look at uh, this passage under three headings this morning. Uh, first of all, we live to praise God. Second, know you are the sons of God. And third, understand the plan of God. And so here in the first few verses, uh, verse 4, 
He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And so Paul uh, gives four, uh, sorry, three main headings and the three main things that Paul is explaining is he starts off, praise God, blessed be God. We live to praise God because we are chosen to be blameless. So we live to praise God because we are chosen to be blameless. We have to praise God for everything that he has done. This, this, this doxology, these uh, 11 verses where Paul pours out his heart in praise to God, he is saying, praise God for everything that he has done. Now, you know, sometimes we get a bit grumpy. You know, things are going wrong uh, in our lives. You know, there's a pandemic, pandemic and the government, you know, at whatever level, uh, has been messing up in all sorts of spectacular ways. And, you know, besides that, they're not delivering on their promises. And, you know, besides that, uh, they're making things hard for Christians and we're getting away from our Christian values. And Paul says, praise God in all circumstances for everything that he has done. Now, you know, when Paul writes this, uh, he's most probably writing from prison. He is... Uh, it's Nero, who is the emperor at the time, and Nero has uh, falsely blamed the Christians for burning down Rome. Uh, many of the Jews and certainly the Christians have been driven out of Rome, and the persecution is beginning in the Roman Empire, the real serious persecution from the emperor down. And Nero is one of the bad guys who started off the persecution. And Nero is emperor in Rome, and Paul is in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel uh, because of the persecution of the Jews who are starting to turn against the Christians who are in the synagogues. And Paul doesn't say one word of his circumstances in prison, but he says, praise God for everything that he has done. In everything, give thanks. Our lives should be characterized by gratitude to God in every circumstance. And we should be focusing on what God has done, not on the difficulties that are in our lives. We're all facing difficulties. Um, truth be told, uh, there are many other places and many other countries and many other Christians who are facing far, far greater difficulties than we are and Paul says to them, and he says to us, praise God for everything that he has done. Our lives should be filled with gratitude. Look what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 at the end of this book. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, blessed be God who has done all of these great things to, uh, for us. We have to praise him and our lives should be characterized by praise and gratitude and thankfulness to God for everything that he has done. Now, why do we praise God, Paul says? Because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We may not have all of the things that we think we need to make life comfortable. We may not have uh, the freedoms that we want or we may not have uh, the things in life that we think are desirable, but God has given us every spiritual blessing that we will ever need. He has given us abundant life in the Spirit. Look, listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10. I have come that they, which is you, might have life and have it 
more abundantly, might have it in all of its fullness. That's the life that Jesus came to bring us. Life in all of its fullness. Life more abundantly. That's the life that Jesus has promised. And that's the life that we can have if we focus on the spiritual blessings or the blessings of the life in the Spirit that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. If we focus in gratitude on what he has done, we will live lives of abundance and fullness. But if we focus on the difficulties, well, of course, we're going to be grumpy and miserable and things are always going to seem to be going wrong. Our lives should be characterized by gratitude and thankfulness to God for what he has done. And so he chose us in him before the creation of the world. One of the characteristics of this sentence, this praise to God, is that everything is through Jesus Christ. Look at some of the things that he says uh, in, this, in these verses. All of the blessings of our relationship to God are in and through Jesus. They aren't found anywhere else. It's only in living in Jesus, abiding in him, knowing him and loving him that we're going to be filled with all the fullness of the abundant life that he's given us. It says in verse 3, we are blessed in Jesus. It says in verse 4, we're chosen in Jesus. It says in verse 5, we're adopted as sons through Jesus. In verse 6, it says we find grace in Jesus. Verse 7, it says we have redemption in Jesus. Verse 9, it says that God has planned the purpose of his will in Jesus, the purpose for our lives. Verse 12, Paul tells us that our hope is in Jesus. And in verse 13, we're marked with the Holy Spirit or sealed with the Holy Spirit in Jesus. It's only in Jesus that we know God. It's only in Jesus that we're going to have this fullness of life. And it's only in thinking about him, concentrating on him, focusing on him, being grateful to him and praising him that we can know the fullness of life that God has promised to us. Everything that we need is in knowing Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says that he's chosen us in Jesus to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now that, that sentence used to make me nervous, holy and blameless. I'm not blameless. How can I be blameless? He, but he's chosen me to be blameless. And what does it mean when it says he's chosen us to be blameless? You know, if we go back into the Old Testament, we can see the example of David, who uh, was not a faultless man. He um, failed in his family life. He failed in uh, bringing up his children in a way uh, that would be honoring and obedient to God. Uh, he failed in many ways. And then to cap it all off, um, he committed adultery and then committed murder uh, in order to hide that adultery. David was not, you know, a sinless man. Uh, we can look at David and we can say, well, I've never done that, and I've never done that, and I've never done those things. Well, I've never achieved all the things that David did, but boy, I certainly haven't committed the sins that he committed. And yet, David is always saying, I'm a blameless man. If you look in Psalm chapter 26 and verse 11, he, he says and he prays to God, I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. Or in Psalm 101 verse 2, he says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. So what is, what is David talking about when he says and he claims in these very, very strong terms? That's only two of the verses where he talks about, I'm righteous. You know, come and save me in the integrity of my life. I'm, I'm blameless. Come and save me. Look after me. I, I live to be blameless in your sight. So we need to understand that to be blameless, as David is claiming to be blameless, a blameless person is someone who is loyal to their covenant with God 
And when they sin, they make use of the sacrifices that God has provided. And so David was a blameless man because he was loyal to the covenant he had with God. And every time he sinned, he admitted his sin and he made use of the sacrifices that God has provided. That's what it means to be righteous and blameless uh, in our relationship with God. God knows that we sin, go straight to him and confess our sin and, and claim the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. And so the first point that Paul makes in these first two verses, three and four, uh, four and five, is that we should live our lives to praise God because he chose us to be blameless in his sight. The second thing is that he, we need to know that we are the sons of God. <clears throat> this is what he says in, in verse 5 to 8. In love, uh, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So he chose us in Jesus to bring him praise through his grace. So this chapter is a very key set of verses that talk about our election, our predestination as sons of God. And... The first thing to understand about this idea that we are elected or we are chosen or we are, have been predestined by God to be his children is that the point that Paul is making is this is not our idea. Salvation was not our idea. Salvation was from God. It was not our initiative that started us on the journey to God. It was God's initiative that started him on the journey to find us. So salvation, the first thing about being chosen is that it's God who chooses us, not us who chooses God. It's God who takes the initiative. We can't claim any glory out of the fact that we know God or are Christians, that we have faith in him because we are sinful, weak people. And it's only through his grace that we can come into his presence. It's only through his grace that we can know God. It's only through his grace that he found us because it's his initiative, it's not our initiative. Now, it is possible that we can resist the grace of God. We can resist God's grace, and many people are resisting God's grace. But it's only through God's grace that we can know him, that we can come into his presence. The second thing is that he predestined us, or he chose us, knowing in advance, uh, to adopt us as sons. Now, a little bit of a, a tricky thing here. Uh, we're in a bit of an in-between stage in our culture. Certainly uh, in universities and um, in, in the wider culture, we must always talk about equality between men and women. And so when we read this sentence... Uh, some people, when they read this sentence and it says that he predestined us for adoption as sons, they're going to say, well, you know, that's a little bit sexist. Shouldn't it be saying that he uh, chose us for adoption as sons and daughters of the living God? Shouldn't uh, there be a bit of equality here? And other people will say, no, no, uh, when it says sons, it automatically means sons and daughters and uh, we should just get over the problem. Uh, the culture back then used the term uh, for men, equally for men and women, and we shouldn't worry too much about it. And uh, so some people say, no, it's very sexist, and other people say, no, don't worry about it. But I think we're actually misunderstanding this verse here, the force. If we're arguing about equality on this sentence, we're misunderstanding the point that Paul is trying to make. Uh, he's very deliberately saying, you men and you women, 
you have both been adopted as sons of God. You've been chosen to be adopted as sons. You know, in our culture, um, if uh, people want more children or they don't have any children and they want to have children, they adopt. And so some uh, friends of ours uh, from some time ago, they uh, adopted two little children because they couldn't have any of their, of their own. And so they adopted, uh, first of all, a little girl, and then they adopted a little boy. Uh, they were only, I think, several months old at the time. Uh, sometimes people adopt children who are two or three years old, and then they raise them as if they're their own children because they want to have a family. No one ever did that in Paul's time. No one ever adopted a baby girl. No one ever adopted a baby boy. Because when you adopted someone, you adopted them to be your heir. And so there was a man, there might have been a man, there, in fact, in Roman times, there were quite a few wealthy men, men of high standing, and they didn't have a son to carry on their name. And so usually uh, they would find a trusted servant, someone who they knew and uh, could really put their trust in, who was it working in their household, usually maybe a steward or uh, a high-ranking slave in their household, and they would adopt that person. They would adopt that person, and the purpose of that adoption was that that person would become their heir and carry on their family name. And so Paul is referring to this sort of adoption. And he's saying that you, you have been chosen so that you can be adopted as an adult male to be a son of God, to be the heir, to be the inheritor, to carry on the name. And so, for example, uh, you might have a wealthy factory owner and he didn't have anyone uh, to carry on his name and to inherit his factory and to inherit uh, his goods and to then carry on his life's work and take over the running of the factory and continue on. And so that person would adopt an adult who he knew uh, was a good man and was loyal to him and who he trusted and he was good friends with. And that person would then have the job of carry on, carrying on that man's work and his name and run the factory for him and carry on his name after he died. And that's the idea. We have been chosen as sons to be his heirs, to carry his name and to carry on his work. That's why he has chosen us as his sons. And so you whether you're a man or a woman or a child or whoever you are, you have been adopted as an heir and, and as Paul says someone else, somewhere else, as a fellow heir with Jesus Christ to carry his name and to be his son and to be his heir and to carry on the work that he is doing. That is why we have been chosen. And so this is not excluding women or including them in some way that blots them out but all of you have been chosen he's not really saying you're adopted to sonship but you're adopted to be the heir the inheritor of all that he has done and so this is in accordance with the pleasure and will of God why to the praise of his glorious grace so know that you are the sons of God an inheritor of all the grace that comes through Jesus Christ because he chose us to bring him praise through his grace. And this grace that God has given us is not just dribbled out in little pieces here and there, but it's been lavished on us. His grace has been lavished on us so that our lives should be to the praise of his glory. So we live to praise God and you need to know that you are the sons of God, the heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we need to understand the plan of God. We need to understand why is God doing this? Why has God chosen to do things this way? 
why has God chosen to send Jesus to adopt us into his family so that we might be the sons of God? And so we read that in verse, verses 8 to 10, um, starting halfway uh, through. So according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, then it says, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is God's plan. This is the purpose that he had from all eternity. And he has this plan in all wisdom and understanding. It was not a last minute plan. You know, when God created Adam, he created him uh, to live in the garden and to fill the earth. And uh, there's a sense in which the garden was, a, was to be a temple for God, a place for meeting with God. And Adam was given this job of expanding and filling the whole earth with the glory of God. And he failed. And God didn't say, oh no, oops, he failed. What do I do now? God already had a plan in place from the beginning of time in all wisdom and understanding, he had a plan, and he set that plan in action the minute that Adam triggered off the default, when Adam sinned and failed and appeared to bring God's original plan into disrepair. God already had a plan, and this was the original plan from the very beginning, because it was made in wisdom and understanding. It wasn't made off the cuff, it wasn't made... Uh, you know, just quickly in a panic because he hadn't got enough supplies, but it was made in w with wisdom, with care, with understanding, and it was executed at exactly the right time. And it's a plan that gives God joy. It good, gives God great pleasure to bring out this plan, to unfold it, and to make it known to us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy he set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is a plan made with care. This is a plan that gives God great joy. But what is the plan? The plan of the gospel, the plan of salvation, is not just to make things nice for you. It's not just to rescue you from hell. It's just not to make you comfortable and so things are great in your world. Things might be terrible in your world at the moment. We might be going through a pandemic or we might be persecuted or we might be failing in our business or we might uh, have things, uh, our family life crashing down around our heads and things might appear to be terrible in our world, but still God's plan goes on and keeps on unfolding. Because the ultimate end of the gospel is not us or our comfort or our satisfaction with life. The ultimate end of the gospel is Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul says so many times that our salvation is in him. God's given us grace in him. Everything that we have is in Jesus Christ. And it's all focused on Jesus. It's not focused on us. The ultimate end of the gospel is the glory and centrality and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what he says there. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Jesus, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The ultimate plan of the gospel is to bring everything together, united, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be fulfilled in your life, if you're going to have satisfaction and joy and live the abundant life, then we must understand that this is God's plan, that he wants to bring everything united together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all thing according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ 
might be to the praise of his glory. Now here is where we start to see the unfolding nature of, the, of, of our predestination, of the fact that we have been chosen as his sons. Because we are chosen to do a work. Just like Abraham was chosen, the focus was not on Abraham to just simply to bless Abraham, to make Abraham someone special. Abraham was chosen so that in him all the nations of the world would be blessed. And that is what Paul says here, that we were chosen, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So here he's talking about the first apostles and himself as an apostle. We who were the first to be chosen were chosen so that we might bring... uh, Praise to his glory, the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why Abraham was chosen, to bless all the nations of the world. That's why Paul was chosen, to make known the glories of Jesus Christ to all the world. And so he goes on to say that that's why we were chosen, and that's why you were chosen. He says in verse 13, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That's why we were chosen, to bring praise and glory to him, so that the whole world can hear about Jesus. Abraham was chosen so that all the nations of the world could be blessed. Paul was chosen so that everyone could hear about the glories of Jesus Christ and bring praise to his glory. And now we too, as we've heard, we have been chosen not for blessing for ourselves, but in order that more people can hear, more people can see in our lives the glory of Jesus Christ. And that glory is when we find satisfaction in Jesus. That fulfillment is when we find our fulfillment, not in the circumstances of life, but in knowing that Jesus Christ is the greatest uh, glory that this world has ever seen, and that we can be saved in him and find grace in him, and everybody else can too. And so that is God's purpose. That was God's purpose from the beginning, that everything can be brought together in Jesus Christ. And that's why we're adopted as sons and heirs of the living God. Not so that we can have a special place, but so that we can carry on the family business. And so that we can bring praise and honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose, to honor Jesus and to bring everything under his headship so that his praise might be spread around the world and his glory might be known by everyone. And so we have been chosen and we've been adopted so that we might also inherit this great purpose that God has, that we might be inheritors of his grace and his glory in Jesus Christ. And what does it mean that we are the heirs, fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, that we also carry on the family business? And that is that we bring praise and honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's God's plan. And that is our main goal, not to live for ourselves, but our purpose is to live for him, to live in him and to bring praise, honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to finish, I'm just going to read this one verse in Romans chapter 11, verse 36. It says, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.